it on my laptop screen Ready for the Python scene All those lines of text so clean Let's code and chase that dream Python world, here we go In this video, we're going to be talking about functions in Python, as well as the black box analogy. Now, many of you may have had previous experience with functions in mathematics, but mathematical functions are a bit different than programming functions. Mathematical functions define a rule that assigns exactly one output to each valid input. For example, we might have a function like this that's equal to x cubed plus 3. And with a mathematical function like this, an input of x equals 2 is always going to give us the same output, in this case, 7. Mathematical functions are deterministic. That means they always produce the same result for the same input. Programming functions, on the other hand, are reusable blocks of code that perform a specific task, and they're not necessarily deterministic. Let's take a look at some examples. First, we have round. This is a built-in function to Python. And if you give it a number like 1.23456, it will round that number and produce the rounded number as output. In this case, we would just get a 1. But with programming functions, we're not bound to having just one output for the same input. We could have a wide variety of outputs that are different each time we call the function. For example, randint is from the random module. It takes a lower bound and an upper bound, and it produces a random number between those two values. In this case, we're giving it 1 and 10, so it could produce something like a 3, but then when we call it again, it could give us a 10, and if we call it again, it could give us something like a 7. It could be a different output each time we call the function. Because of this, we say programming functions are not deterministic. They can return different values for the same input, just like we saw with randint. Python functions can also return no values at all, or they can take no inputs. So what are the key differences here? Well, first one is determinism. Mathematical functions always produce the same result for the same input. We saw that example with x cubed plus 3 always produces a 7 for an input of 2. But programming functions can produce different results due to factors like randomness, user input, or external data. For example, randint example we saw could produce a different value for each function call. Another key difference is the number of outputs. Mathematical functions always produce a single output. However, programming functions can return multiple values. In Python, this is done using tuples or some sort of collection. But they may also return nothing at all, such as a none value. The purpose is also different between these two types of functions. Mathematical functions are focused purely on calculations and returning a value whereas programming functions serve as reusable building blocks to perform a variety of tasks. And this can include things like calculations, data manipulation, interfacing with hardware, and it could also just do output to the console rather than returning a value. So programming functions are far more versatile. They're just reusable blocks of code that make our life easier when we're programming because we don't have to repeat code and we can reuse code that we've already made in the past. This brings us to the black box analogy. And we can sort of see programming functions as little black boxes of code. You input something into these black boxes. The black box does something. We don't even have to understand how that something happens or what it is. And then we get some sort of output. For example, you don't really need to know how the print function works in Python, as long as you know what kind of inputs go in and what it kind of outputs it produces, at least to the console. Same thing with something like the round function. You don't need to know under the hood how round is implemented in Python. You just need to know what kind of inputs it takes and what kind of outputs it gives to be able to use that function. So the user of the function is not required to know or understand about the inner workings of the function. To give another example, here is the pow function from Python. This is another built-in function, and it simply raises a base to some sort of exponent. So if we gave 5 as input as the base, 2 is input as the exponent, we would get 5 to the power of 2, which is 25. And again, we don't really have to understand how that function works, as long as we understand the inputs and outputs and all the documentation that goes around it. And this is something that's great for reuse, because we can share our functions with other people 
And when our functions come from a credible source, like being built into Python, that means we can usually assume that they are relatively bug free and probably not the issue with our code. This is great because that means less testing. Let's take a look at an example. And here we have a fairly straightforward example where we're raising two to the power of something, where that something is hard coded in the variable exp, and right now that's set to 10. So if we were to run this code, we get an output that looks like this. Two to the power of 10 is 1024. And what really powers this is this call to the pow function. This is that built-in function in Python that raises a base to a certain exponent. Let's take a closer look at this now and explore it as a flowchart. So on the left here, we have all of the lines of code from our little program here. This includes things like setting exp to 10, calling the pow function, getting the result, and outputting the result. On the right here, we have those functions from Python's standard library. And this is why functions are so great. They've already been created for us, in this case by the people who made the Python standard library, and they mean we don't have to solve these problems ourselves. For example, we don't have to write an implementation of the pow function, and we don't have to write an implementation of the print function. So we can then use these functions in any of our programs over and over again, and we have some assurances that they'll probably be fairly error and bug free. That means we can focus our testing efforts and our debugging efforts just on our code, the code that we wrote, without worrying about the whole Python standard library. So you can kind of think whenever a function is called, it jumps out of your program, runs that code, and then jumps back immediately after to where you left off. So in this case, we have one jump to pow, and we have one jump to print, and then it always jumps back to our code. So in that last example, we were sending some values to the pow function. But how did we know what values to send it and what order to put them in? Well, typically you would find this out by looking up the function's documentation in Python's official documentation. So since pow is a built-in function, Python does provide a description of it as well as a list of parameters it takes. So we can see that documentation on the screen now. And the way we would read this is first we have that function name, pow, but then we have a list of parameters. And this tells us what inputs this function takes as well as the order they come in. Now you may see that there's an extra parameter here that we didn't use. This would be that mod parameter. The reason we didn't have to provide it a value is because it had a default value set. In the documentation, this is represented by that equals none statement, which means that if we don't give mod a value, it's going to default to none. This isn't limited just to none, it could be equals any value and have any default. So there's an important concept here, and that is parameters. Parameters are the input to a function. And these are always specified in the function's definition. And as we saw in that last example, pow has three parameters, base, exp, and mod. So we would say base, exp, and mod are all parameters to the pow function. Now, another similar concept are arguments. An argument is the actual value we provide to a function's parameter during a function call. As an example, if we were to call the pow function with the values two and five, 2 would be the argument for the base parameter, and 5 would be the argument for the exp parameter. The mod parameter would just get a default value because we didn't provide it here, and it had that default set in the documentation. Now, this is a fairly important distinction, especially when we start making our own functions in another video. One way that you can remember is that argument starts with an A, and actual starts with an A, and arguments are the actual values that we pass to parameters. Another important topic is the return value. So functions can have some output that it sends back to whatever part of code called it. Now it's important here to distinguish between output, which is printing something to the console or terminal, and output, which is returning a value. When we say that a function returns a value, we don't mean that it's outputting it to the screen, we mean that it's returning it back to the code, so that could be stored in a variable or used in some way in that program. This allows functions to provide results of their computations back to our programs, and then we can actually do something with that value other than just outputting it to the screen. Technically, Python functions always return a single value. However, and as we'll learn later on in the course, this single value can be a collection of multiple values, such as a tuple. We'll get into tuples, lists, and sets later on in the course, 
But for now, note that we can return multiple values if we pack them into something like a tuple. Let's take a look at that pow example again and see what the arguments and returns are. So when we call the pow function, we might send it values like 2 and 10. These are the arguments. So 2 would be the argument for the base parameter, and 10 would be the argument for the exp parameter. The pow function then returns a result. In this case, that's 1024. And then we set the value of the variable power equal to the result of the pow function. So then power would be equal to 1024. Then one of the last lines in our program outputs the result using the print function. In this case, it sends the string 2 to the power of 10 equals 1024.0 to the print function as an argument. And this is what the print function is going to output to the console. But keep in mind the concept of what it outputs to the console and what our function returns is different. So the print function would actually return nothing. It doesn't have a return in terms of what it sends back to the code. It only has an output to the console. Another important concept we need to discuss are nested function calls. And this occurs when a function is used as an argument within another function. What this effectively does is it takes the output of one function and sends it in as the input of another function, sort of connecting them together. Let's take a look at an example. Here we have a line of code that has a few function calls that are nested within each other. In the center, we have the absolute function, then we have power, then round. And what this is doing is basically just rounding the result of the square of an absolute value. So let's break this down a little bit. So in the center here, we have the call to the absolute function, and we're sending it a value of negative 4.7. The absolute function will find the absolute value, which is the positive value. Now we have a call to the power function, and it's going to raise whatever that output from the absolute function is to the power of 2. And then we have a call to the round function, which is going to round that result to one decimal point. Let's take a closer look and see how this works. So first we have the call to the absolute function. And this is going to be evaluated first because it's the most nested call. It means that we have to evaluate this before we can evaluate all those other function calls. We don't know what the result of power is going to be until we know what the input into it is going to be. So in this case, the value negative 4.7 goes into the absolute function, and as output, we get 4.7. Because this is nested in that call to power, that means this output is then going to be sent as input to the power function. So in this case, 4.7 becomes the argument for the base parameter of power, and we also have an input of 2 for the exponent. The pow function then produces a result of 22.09, and it does have the trailing 0003 due to floating point error, which we've talked about before. But just to quickly summarize, floating point values aren't exact in the computer's memory, so this means they produce an approximation which can have this small error to it. Which is why the next function call is important, because we round this value. So we're taking that output from the pow function, which was equal to 4.7 raised to the power of 2, and we're putting that as input to the round function as the number we have to round. Then we're also inputting a 1 to tell it to round it to one decimal place, and our output is 22.1. Chaining multiple function calls together like this can be extremely powerful, as it allows us to do complex tasks that are more complex and interesting than what each function could do individually. I will point out, however, that usually in your code, you want to split these calls up a little bit, maybe store the results in variables, and then use that in the next call, rather than all push together in one line like this. There's nothing wrong with putting it all together in one line like this, but it makes it a little bit harder to read because you sort of have to trace where the parentheses are. Is that two part of power or is that two part of round? So it is better to split it up and store the results in variables. The next thing we're going to talk about are keyword arguments. And we've already seen some of these, especially with print, but they allow us to pass values to a function by explicitly stating the name of the parameter that this is an argument for. And this really improves readability, but it also gives us more flexibility in our function calls because we can specify the arguments in any order. Let's take a look at an example. And again, we're going to take a look at the pow function. But in this case, maybe we want to provide the exponent first and then the base. And that's exactly what we're doing in this example. But what we've done is we provided the parameter name before the argument value. 
And this is why we were able to specify the exponent exp first before the base. So when we provide the parameter name, these can come in any order in our function call. And this makes it a little bit clear to the reader who might not be familiar with the pow function about what these arguments actually mean. They don't have to go to the Python documentation and look it up. So in this case, we're saying exp is getting the argument of two, the value of two, and the base parameter is getting the argument of 10. As another example, and one we saw before in our print video, was that the print function has some optional parameters that we can specify keyword arguments for by actually saying the parameter name. So the sep parameter sets that character or string that occurs between all the values sent to print, and the end parameter specifies the character or string that's going to happen at the end of that line. By default, end would be equal to a line break, and sep or separator would be equal to a space. By using keyword arguments here, we can change that default behavior. And this is another common use for keyword arguments to give values to parameters that already have a default set. So in this case, we'd get the output of a dash b dash c. Those dashes are coming from that separator keyword argument. And at the end, instead of a line break, we'd get that exclamation mark because we changed the default line break in the end parameter to an exclamation mark character. So that's all I have for you in this video. In our next video, we're going to start diving into creating our own functions, and things are going to get far more interesting. Thank you for watching, and have a great day.